Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-atheist. Welcome to my channel. Like and share the video. Join the Rabbit Nation, a nation of people dedicated to normalizing atheism and deconversion by hitting the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel in a more tangible way, hit the join button. And your membership options that lead to citizenship in the Rabbit Nation will be presented to you. Today I'm continuing to look at the list of things Jim Palmer says, a, a former megachurch pastor says, that the religious establishment does not want you to know. And today we're looking at number five on his list, which reads like this. Prayer doesn't work the way you think it does. You can't bribe God or change God's mind through obedience, devotion, or groveling. The underlying theistic premises of prayer are untenable. I do want to read those first three words again. Prayer doesn't work. Uh, I have this long-running discussion on prayer on this channel, and I have suggested what it really is, is self-talk. You've created this imaginary person to talk to, and this imaginary person just happens to be God, who's all-powerful, who can answer all your questions, do all your stuff. You have this higher imaginary, you know, it's like a lot of imaginary friends are more capable than the person that, that creates them. And I have to say that it doesn't work uh, in the sense that Palmer says as well, a non-existent God doesn't answer prayer at all. Now, biblically, the idea of changing God's mind is definitely there, and there are many exonerations to pray, but mostly the problem theologically with prayer is that either God is, A, going to do what he wants anyway, no matter what you pray, he's already preordained everything that's going to happen, or if he hasn't, then isn't it kind of arrogant to say that God's going to change his mind just for you? If God's going to get what he wants in the end anyway, why don't we just skip the prayer part and get to his will and save a lot of time? Uh, so theologically speaking, I always wrestled with prayer and I got kind of got rid of it uh, because of what, he, of what Palmer says. You know, it, who am I to grovel before God? Who am I, if God exists, who would I be to show any kind of devotion or obedience? What is that going to actually do if the divine plan is bigger than me anyway? And so there's a lot of inconsistencies and inconsistent logic about prayer. So it doesn't work the way you think it does. The real nature of prayer from a religious establishment point of view is to keep people hoping in the religion that it's connected to. It's about creating faith in the exaggerated claim that God is on your side and is going to do something for you. From a religious leader point of view, if things don't go expected as expected in prayer, then the person offering up the prayer is just not doing it right. It's one of those things when you look at how people respond to unanswered prayers, it's very interesting because it's never the product's fault. It's always the fault of the person that uses it. So if, if you pray and don't get what you want, you either did it wrong, you did it with the wrong motivations, you didn't have the right heart about it, there's always an excuse of why it didn't work and that excuse is always focused on the prayer, the person that's praying. And really, though, it's always about increasing the faith or creating this mental image, once again, of indoctrination that allows a person to basically, well, you know, if that didn't happen, so it must be my fault. Okay, so you're always blaming yourself for the failure of the supposed promises. So, yeah, it, it kind of works that way for the religious establishment. But uh, is prayer really answered when answers do come? Is it answered by God? No. Uh, what usually happens is one out of 20 prayers are answered, and I might actually be high. Uh, I did my own journal one time, writing down every prayer request I had during a, a prayer thing, and then routinely going back through those prayer requests and seeing if they were ever answered. I think my rate was like one in 25 got answered. And when I started to realize that I wasn't getting a lot of answers to prayer, I wasn't even getting the no or just wait answers. I was getting nothing. And most of those prayers that were answered were prayers that could be easily chalked up to circumstances, uh, like prayers for healing. You know, I went, I went to the doctor or the person went to the doctor. So how did I know that it wasn't the medicine that fixed the problem? I didn't. So I would put a notation by that prayer. Well, it could be the prayer or it could be that they got treatment, <laughs> okay? So, you know, which one actually helped them is, is a matter of question. The one thing I never did have was, you know, like a visual of God actually, you know, doing the work. 
you know, I couldn't get a picture or a video of God actually answering a prayer. Couldn't get any empirical evidence that God actually did anything at all. Um, and so I was really taking prayer on faith, whether I was a believer. And there's other research in prayer that I've read over the years, you know, that is problematic as people prayed for when they're about to get treatment in a hospital for medical procedures. If a person is knowingly being prayed for, they know it. They do worse than somebody who doesn't know if anybody's praying for them at all. It's almost like a perform sort of performance anxiety, I guess, that results in a negative result, that the person doesn't want to let everybody down and God down, so they actually get themselves into an anxious state, which actually is negative when you're going through a procedure. You really need to relax and you know let your body heal. And you know when you knowingly understand that somebody's praying, you get a little tense, and that doesn't, you know, this better work, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. And it ends up backfiring. So, uh, you know, there's nothing that fails like prayer. Prayer fails a lot. And, but the tool of it is more of an indoctrination tool. It's more about keeping people faithful to the idea that somehow God is going to come through them. So why doesn't the establishment want to know that, you to know this? Because if prayer is exposed as fraudulent, then the whole gig is up. It is the absence of everything a personal relationship with God is about. Okay, when you look at prayer in the context of, say, Christianity, you pray to enter into this relationship. You pray to continue this relationship. Worship is basically prayer of the community to God. The community gathers to pray. There is so much hinging in many religions that prayer is a central element to it. And if you realize that prayer doesn't really do anything, then the whole gig of religion, the, the whole mechanism that really keeps people faithful is up. You know, if religious leaders can keep you praying and hoping for answers from God, then they never get scrutinized as to whether or not what they're doing is actually helpful. It never occurs to people that are praying and really devoted to it that the whole thing might be a fraud. Getting a person to be religiously devoted is a way of keeping them in the fold. And that's why the religious establishment doesn't want you to really look at prayer and decide whether or not it actually really works in the practical real world. Deconverting from religion, especially if you become an atheist, means that the prayer is only possible. The only real good thing I could ever come out of prayer was uh, this form of self-talk. But you basically self-talk the idea of, of the supreme person that you're talking to and realize you're talking to yourself then you can actually discard it altogether if you really want to. I've said before that some for some people, constructive self-talk is very beneficial for them, but you have to get rid of the delusion that you're talking to a supreme being and instead realize you're talking to yourself for that to be true. Otherwise, many people can discard it altogether and actually start doing something about the situations instead. You know, if you're having problems with your spouse, instead of praying about it, perhaps you should seek out good counseling and work on your communication skills or whatever the issue is and actually try to solve it together. Uh, if you're short on money, maybe re-examining your career and maybe looking at education options, changing jobs or whatever might be a better option rather than praying and hoping God just drops a million dollar check in your, in your uh, mailbox. If you're having serious mental issues, getting therapy to help with it, getting the medical care that you need when you're in a situation where you need healing. In other words, what you can do with prayer in all of these situations is take the Occam's razor and, and take it all right out of the equation. It's an unnecessary step. The thing is that all believers just add this step to the mix, and really what they're doing is delaying, wasting time, or in some cases, they'll act, I've actually seen it in the Pentecostal church that I used to grow up in. Well, I'm not going to go to the doctor now. I've been prayed for. Yeah, that usually ends up being a mistake, okay? And... That's the problem with it. Prayer allows you to think that you're doing something when you're really not doing anything at all. And it's kind of what's annoying to me now when I see people, oh, I'm facing this situation. Oh, thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and... You haven't done anything for them. Not, it causes you to go through this loop where if I just pray for them, then I've done something for them, but I haven't actually fixed their situation at all. Whereas if I had the means to fix their situation, you know, like, oh man, my, my, my friend has been in this car accident and what they really could use is, you know, like, you know, a good recommendation of where to go for after treatment for their injuries or maybe some help getting their car fixed up and up and running, you know, 
they have insurance, but it doesn't cover everything. You know, I, you know, I'm, I, I really have a lot more money than I really need, so I could help them out, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to pray for them because that's almost as good. And it really allows you, there's a, I hate to say it, but there's a dehumanizing element to prayer in the sense that you can say, I'm going to pray for somebody instead of actually engaging your human empathy and say, well, I'll just give it to God to show empathy for them instead of, you know, doing it myself. Um, and that's kind of one of my biggest problems with prayer and the whole thoughts and prayers thing. Okay, why don't you do more than thoughts and prayers and actually do something to help them? And one other interesting aspect of deconversion is the grief that comes from losing your imaginary friend. It's a, it's kind of becomes weird. If you're a longtime believer like I was and you did pray fairly regularly like I did, then all of a sudden not having a God to pray to is a very lonely experience for a while until you shift in your mentality. Well, you know, maybe I need to talk to actual people and have them help me solve my problems if I can. And it's a real deconversion issue for a lot of people in faith. As you're coming out of faith and having to wrestle with this question of who do I talk to now, it actually leads to some better, more productive solutions. There's actually uh, a loneliness to that for a while, but it leads to a liberation. That loneliness survives with time, and liberation comes in the idea of focusing your actual constructed means of dealing with the problems, and that gives real tangible results instead of always wanting God to do something when he never does. But getting back to Mr. Palmer's statement that the underlying thesis premise of prayer are untenable, that is true when you really think about it. You're not going to sway the all-powerful God by any amount of obedience. You're not going to sway him by any amount of devotion or groveling. If God wants to do something, it doesn't matter what you pray. Uh, the only time your prayers then actually work was already in line with what God wants. So why bother praying in the first place? And this is something that became a deconversion issue for some. It wasn't my focus, but I know some people who have deconverted because they began to think about prayer and realized that it didn't really have any value on a practical sense from a theological point of view, from a religious point of view. And when you really get down to it, prayer is just one of those other, you know, use of spiritual disciplines. I've talked about that before, where the spiritual discipline is used to keep the faithful faithful. It's used to keep you having hope. It's used to keeping you having faith in this system. And once that arose, once you realize prayer really isn't all that helpful in that regard, what you began to do is discard the whole notion in the first place. And it really leads to more of a, shall I say, um, a more pragmatic look at how to solve your problems. Getting rid of prayer as a solution, getting rid of thoughts and prayers as an answer to somebody else's problem that you see really does start to generate, you know, a real healthy lifestyle, in my opinion, once you deconvert. Because now I look at thoughts and prayers and say, well, I'm not going to say not thoughts and prayers. I might say, well, if I could do something, would I? And sometimes it's just being honest. See, I think the people that say thoughts and prayers are just not being honest. They have no intention of actually helping this person, so they want to say something where it looks like they're helping. And that way the other person will think nicely of them. When somebody gives me thoughts and prayers, I say, well, thanks for nothing. Okay, <laughs> you know, you're not really helping me. Why don't you just say, well, I could do something for you, but I'm not going <laughs> to. But I am going to give you thoughts and prayers. Uh, that doesn't really mean much to me. And it's kind of one of those moments where I think prayer from a religious standpoint is social lubrication. And that's all it is. Uh, it's a way for the society of the church to kind of lubricate itself is talking about praying together and talking together and meditating together and doing all those spiritual disciplines, worship and all that. And that's kind of disappears when you're deconverted. I have been out of the church now, oh man, you know, six years. I think it was the last time I darkened the door of a church um, a long time ago in 2018. And, you know, I've talked about this, you know, this is kind of my anniversary week of walking away from Christianity. And in another month, I'll talk more about how I walked away from God altogether. And, you know, it's like, it's this concept. When you realize that these are just concepts and ideas and not reality, that's the biggest thing to deal with in deconverting from prayer, that this is just a concept, this is just an idea 
talk to this big, powerful imaginary friend and he'll help you out. Well, that really is appealing to somebody who feels like they don't have anybody to talk to, don't have anybody that's going to help them out. That's a very appealing idea, and it's what draws people into the faith, and it's what keeps them into the faith. And the religious establishment definitely wants, doesn't want you to realize that. So that's my kind of thoughts on it for today. Uh, as always, this is kind of a discussion starter. For those of you deconverting, yes, I did move this to Fridays. Uh, keeping Wednesday open allows me a little bit more time to deal with usually my reaction video on Thursday. So I moved this discussion to Fridays. And once this we're done with all 14 of Mr. Palmer's points, I'm going to be kind of shifting Fridays into more of a political, social issue vein. And all my deconversion study is going to be with the deconverters Bible study, including we'll take the text and we'll talk about a deconversion issue that comes out of the text, or maybe not. We'll just come up with an issue that we'll keep going there. But that's the kind of shift that's going to happen in the next couple of months. And I just want to make everybody aware of that. But this is why this is moving to Fridays, because this is going to be the time slot for something else eventually. But I want to finish this series because I think it's important. So uh, with that said, thanks for every like, share, subscribe. I want to give a shout out to my members, to my citizens, to my rabid citizens, to my tribunes. You guys are awesome. You support the channel in a very tangible way, and it gives me a good feeling to know that people are supporting the work of, of deconversion and atheism and getting that normalized so people don't treat us so badly. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, your support is always appreciated. Uh, as always, live your best life. You only get one go around, and then it's over. And then, uh, you know, you, it, it's over. And so you want to take all your time, money, and opportunities and give them to the people you love and care for, to yourself, and to make this a better world. And don't waste them on the trappings of religion and faith. That's a dead end. I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.